Hey, I'm Eddie. I'm an engineer here at Meta. I'm here to discuss the single deployment engine that we use for the majority of our deployments. Hey, I'm Brian Fitzpatrick. I'm also a software engineer at Meta. And to set the stage, I wanted to share an interesting story that we feel shows the necessity of Conveyor, which is our single deployment engine. So picture yourself in this scenario. You're a Facebook user in 2014. You head to the site, but it's inaccessible. You see an error page. So what is your first instinct in that scenario? It's called the cops, right? You dial 911. We actually had a number of people call the police because of this outage. We call it call the cops internally when we refer to this outage. This is interesting because two months before, the issue that caused it was identified and it was fixed and committed to the repository. But no new deployment took place for two months. In general, preventing human mistakes in software deployments at the scale of thousands of engineers is unachievable without unified deployment. So you're going to see how Conveyor's unified deployment system helps resolve these issues. So, Eddie, what was going on back in 2014 that led to these issues? Yeah, well, 10 years ago, deployment at Meta was kind of a mess. We had a lot of bespoke solutions. For instance, our front-end services required a 30,000-line bespoke solution in order to deploy. We couldn't mitigate global outages since each team had their own deployment system, so engineers had to get familiar with the other system before they could really use it. We didn't have a way of blocking diffs during critical periods of the year where we'd like the services to be a bit more stable and not have new changes pushed. And we didn't have a tool to visualize what where deployment was happening, what deployments were happening, and when. So we couldn't really figure out the root cause. And that's what brought us to create Conveyor, the one tool fits all deployment solution at Meta. The first part of this process was to bring new users onto Conveyor by creating Conveyor pipelines. So we had to ensure that Conveyor came batteries included, featuring gradual rollouts, health checks, auto reverts, and the ability to find flexible pipelines. Gradual rollouts are zero downtime deployments. So we don't have to host a set of parallel machines in order to have a zero downtime deployment through Conveyor. Users just auto configure it. We have health checks, so during deployments, automatic checks will happen that make sure a job's healthy or not. We have auto-reverts, so, you know, in case a binary is just happens to get out there and is bad, we can quickly revert to the previous version and fix things up. And we have the ability to define flexible pipelines where we can handle any artifact and orchestrate it along a graph of actions. As of today, Conveyor has over 35,000 deployment pipelines, and they serve millions of machines. Over 97% of our deployments are now fully automated, so humans don't even have to push a single button to get their packages deployed. So with a few of the features in mind that Eddie mentioned, we're going to discuss three different use cases that have adopted Conveyor as a deployment solution, and some of the challenges that we had to resolve for each one. The first use case is FrontFast. So what is FrontFast, and why is it a complicated adoption example? It hosts synchronous functions that clients directly invoke. This is similar to something like AWS Lambda. And for efficiency, a single PHP runtime process can execute multiple of these functions concurrently. Tens of thousands of developers commit code to FrontFast, and thousands of commits happen every day. It runs on over 500,000 machines and deploys a new release every three hours. So this is a complicated deployment having to deploy pretty frequently. So what does this deployment look like? So it's something like this graph. We have phase deployments. There's three pools of machines deployed to in order. The first pool is employee traffic. Next, we proceed to 2% production. And then finally, to the remainder of production, 98% of production traffic. And a release will only proceed to the next pool if it has succeeded on the previous pool. You don't want to deploy to production if you deploy to your employees and you already see issues occurring, right? This makes sense. If we zoom in on a specific pool, you can see that there are two parallel checks happening here in this little box. One path of the deployment processes a small amount of traffic using an experimental version of our PHP runtime. The other processes the remaining traffic with a stable runtime. This is to allow us to detect performance regressions or improvements even to see which version we want to continue through using. So now that we know what a deployment looks like, what kinds of features are required from Conveyor in order to support this? In-place updates are integral. 
describing your deployment with a directed acyclic graph, which allows us to perform many independent tasks in parallel. Speed is important, obviously, since we're deploying every three hours. And the last one is the ability to define what a successful deployment looks like. So going with in-place updates first. So when deploying to a service that is on over 500,000 machines, the standard blue-green deployment is not really an option. Blue-green deployment is where you have a capacity buffer that you deploy to first, and you cut over traffic to serve from that new deployed version. For fast deployments, this buffer has to equal your serving capacity, so you can just do the cut over once. But this means that you need double the capacity to do this. This is not sustainable at scale. You're not going to have a global data center just sitting idle, ready for you to deploy into and switch over. So in-place updates require precise control over individual container updates and the health checks on those containers to ensure the safety of your change. Meta's cluster manager was enhanced to allow updating a specific subset of a jobs container to a new version while keeping the remaining containers on the old version. And it's also integral to allow the service being updated to determine when it's safe to update that container. Our cluster manager's task control interface enables this. FrontFast relies on monitoring health checks, such as the number of fatals, which are 500 errors, the number of unavailable tasks, and the write rate of error logs as a few examples. So if we look at the graph here, you can see during business hours, the request rate goes up. This is production traffic to the site. And our number of task updates that we serve goes down, or deploy goes down. This makes sense because CPU and other hardware resources are being utilized to serve production traffic. We don't want to take that away from production traffic just to deploy an update. But during off-peak hours, you can see the rate of task updates increases to take advantage of more resource utilization. So the second key feature that I mentioned is describing your deployment with a directed acyclic graph. This allows branching and parallel work streams, such as when FrontFast deploys two versions to test different PHP runtimes, as we saw in our deployment pipeline earlier. Sequential stages, like those used by previous conveyor versions, are not generalizable to support these complex use cases, which is why this feature was necessary to unblock adoption of conveyor for FrontFast. And finally, we are going to discuss customizing success. What does success look like for your deployment? When deploying to many hosts, there's a near certainty of transient issues occurring, either network outages or hardware issues popping up. Pick your poison. We don't want to slow down our three-hour release cadence just because some RAM went bad or something. We can customize our success criteria to take these expected transient issues into account. So Conveyor allows each pipeline to describe exactly what success looks like for that particular service. So for FrontFast, as long as 90% of updates succeed, we mark this version as deployed, and we can move on to the next release. So now, Eddie is going to talk about three things that Conveyor needs to support for machine learning model deployments. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about how we leverage Conveyor's flexibility to orchestrate model deployments through a separation of concerns in our pipelines, tight integration with our testing solutions, and talk a little bit about how we horizontally scale Conveyor to support the higher load that model deployments require. So back in 2014, when Conveyor was created, ML wasn't as hot as it is today. I don't actually know the reasons. I was a freshman in high school, and in software, nine years is an eternity. But now, about 15,000 of our pipelines are dedicated to model deployments themselves. Luckily, due to the flexibility that we baked into the system, we were actually able to adapt our orchestration engine of Conveyor for ML model deployments. As seen in the diagram to the right here, we have now parent pipelines and child pipelines. The parent pipeline receives a new package and is responsible for testing this package and tagging it to make sure that it's ready for our various stages of production. For instance, it can be a dog fooding, then alpha, then beta, then production. The child pipelines are the listeners to this parent pipeline that are actually responsible for pushing this package out into the world. They will listen to the parent pipeline when it says, hey, this package is ready for dog fooding, and it'll actually take the package and push onto its new jobs. The parent pipeline will then go look at the child pipelines and say, okay, how's traffic doing on these pipelines? Is it good? Is it bad? 
and if it passes some more tests, it'll then move on to the next stage. Now, that means that Conveyor has to have very tight integration with our testing products. And, well, we do. We run unit tests with our continuous integration before our production binaries are even built, so that's like unit tests or whatever. Then we have integration tests with either predefined parameters or fuzzing options that are run on the production binaries, as well as A-B tests, just to see if we can eke out some performance gains or some performance knowledge on our packages. Finally, we also integrate with our cluster manager, Twine, to, do, to perform canaries, where we can push out our production binary to some subsection of the fleet and see how it performs there. Now, ML models are actually pretty interesting to test because unlike most other services, production binaries don't fail during the testing phase, but actually rather during the deployment phase and usually due to a crash. By separating our ML pipelines into the parent orchestrator, which does the testing, and the child orchestrator, which will do the pushing and then the health checking, we can isolate the issues with our deployment step faster, whether it's unhealthy machines, regional network issues, or even a bad package itself. And despite all the perils of having to constantly push out ML models, we actually are able to make pretty substantial forward progress on them due to 99.9% .9 of all of our deployments through ML being fully automated. We have the confidence that if Conveyor catches something bad, it will revert things before a human has to step in. Now, the interesting thing about ML model deployments is we had to take on a lot more load than Conveyor was initially designed for. We initially attempted to consistently shard the load. So one machine takes on a certain subset of our services, another one does another subset, etc. However, that proved pretty disastrous. If one set of machines just happened to go down one day, suddenly a whole subset of our services couldn't push out new production builds, maybe even for Conveyor itself. Now we have a queue-based system where one worker is in charge of enqueuing items to a queue service, and all of the other workers can take items off that queue. If that main queue loader goes down, we can have other queue loaders pick up from where that first one left off. And this allows us to horizontally scale almost infinitely since we can just add more workers to do more work. This is elaborated on more in the accompanying blog post to this talk. Now, all these features work great for our models, but what about widely shared code at Meta? Fitz, can you take it away? Thanks, Eddie. So in contrast to FrontFast that I discussed earlier, another type of service we support are widely deployed binaries and widely deployed libraries. Widely deployed binaries, or WDBs, are CLI tools or daemons running across the Meta fleet. These are distinct because the deployment is done on a pull basis rather than a push basis like FrontFast was. Each machine in the fleet periodically downloads the new version of the binary being deployed. But this can take a long time, sometimes more than a week to fully roll out to every machine that needs to get the update. These tools are also used infrequently, meaning health check signal takes longer to, co longer to collect. If nobody's using your CLI tool and you're monitoring for health check signals, you're not going to get any data. So because of this, some of them have health gathering periods of up to eight hours. Widely deployed libraries, on the other hand, are common libraries that are used by most, if not all, services across Meta. An example of this is Service Router, which is compiled into nearly every service at Meta. In a monorepo setup like Meta and Google have, changes to a single library like this are compiled into every service that uses it almost immediately. So this means there's a huge potential for widely deployed breakages due to bugs in a single library. So given this potential for high impact breakages from a single bug in one library, we need a way to block these known bad releases from going out to every service at Meta. And the bad package detector is how we solve this problem. So the way it works is you give it two commit hashes, a blame commit, which is the commit that caused the issue that you're experiencing. The fix commit is the commit which fixes it, as you might guess. With this information, we can then examine every single artifact being deployed through conveyor and assert that it was built from a commit that is good. If not, we can show a warning and tell the service owner, hey, there's this, this breakage that is affecting this release. So a good commit is one that is from before the blame commit, or it is from the fix commit and beyond. That makes sense, before the breakage landed or after the fix landed. But just naively blocking based on commit range can lead to unaffected binaries having their release blocked. If my service doesn't include 
the library that has the bug, I should still be able to release, right? So in order to narrow the scope of impacted services, we also analyze the code dependency graph provided by our build system to ensure that problematic code, code that was flagged as having an issue or a problem, is being pulled into the binary, is actually being used before blocking its deployment. In order to do this, we have two different components that analyze the dependency graph that you can see on the screen here. The first one runs logic for every change landed into source control, which is what is starting from the right side here. And it computes affected build targets of those changes up to four hops away. The second component analyzes each binary, which is on the left side of the graph. It analyzes their dependencies up to 10 hops away, which gives us a total detection range of 14 hops, four up from each commit and 10 down from each binary. If they intersect, we know it's impacted by a bad commit and we can safely block the binary. Conveyor runs this validation on every release that comes through the system every minute, just to catch things that, that pop up whenever they do. And that concludes our use case tour. So Eddie, where does that leave us? Yeah, so throughout unification, we actually realized some other benefits in how we could monitor and improve deployments, especially when things went south. As mentioned earlier, during the WDB and WDL section, we have BPD, which helps bugs not make it into production. During sensitive periods, like the holidays, we also might just want to limit all code that makes it to production, to only include specially cherry-picked commits, which we can enable through conveyor's freezes. However, things will go south in production. During situations like that, we can also have a universal kill switch, which will pause globally all deployments that are happening to production. That we can then only spin up production deployments for services that we know are necessary to get the fleet up and running again. Finally, through an integration with Conveyor, we also have a product that allows us to track exactly when revisions enter what regions at Meta, which is very helpful for debugging what went wrong and why. Conveyor, however, wasn't built in a day. We initially started as a rudimentary CLI that would periodically deploy code. Over time, we then added integration with automatic releases through our continuous integration products. Now, that only worked for a subset of packages at Meta, that being 94%. That's great, but that doesn't include our most critical services, such as FrontFast, which was mentioned earlier in the presentation, preventing issues such as the ones we laid out, again, in the intro. Gain to 100% consisted of expanding Conveyor to support all artifacts and releases at Meta, where we then were able to realize the emergent benefications of unification, such as with BPD or our universal deployment timeline, Landline. This, again, is expanded on more in the accompanying blog post for this talk. And now we're deploying with more confidence and less human friction than ever before. Thank you for your time.